Here we are. Okay, Fiona, if you want to take it away. That's great. Thanks, Hannah. Um, I hope everyone can hear me and see the slides clearly. Yeah. Okay, um, great. So um, first of all, I'd like to start by saying a, a massive thank you to Hannah and her colleagues at the Golf Museum for inviting um, myself and Lauren to come and speak this evening as part of National um, Heritage, Sporting Heritage Day. It's a real privilege to be here and also to have such a great turnout is really exciting. Um, this project is a kind of an offshoot of something that we're working on. Um, my interest in golf developed um, from a very young age. My family um, were all active golfers and I played when I was very young. Um, and when I was studying my PhD about 10 years ago, which looked at the development of women's sport in Scotland in the interwar period, I looked at a number of different sports and one of them was golf. From that, um, I then struck up a, a relationship with Hannah at the museum, along with my colleague, Dr. Fiona Reid. And from that, we developed the PhD project that Lauren is now currently undertaking, which is looking at women's golf in the later 20th century. Um, and Lauren will tell you a bit more about that. So this project um, this evening that we're talking about has kind of come from both of our interests, although it's not directly um, something that we have uh, uh, published on yet, we hope to in the future. Um, and we very much welcome your comments and your feedback at the end, because we know there are a number of you here that are passionate about this topic and are experts in it as well. So I'll hand over to Lauren. Thanks Fiona. Um, hello everyone. It's a great pleasure to be speaking to you all today and um, this evening in recognition of National Sporting Heritage Day. Um, as Fiona has mentioned, we're working collaboratively with Hannah and the RNA World Golf Museum on an oral history PhD project um, on women's experiences of playing golf um, at club level in Scotland during the period 1945 to 1995. Um, this evening's talk is based on an article that Fiona and I are currently working on together on the evolution of women's golf fashion in Britain between 1890 and 1940. Um, this research has evolved from our joint interest in women's golf fashion during this period and wider societal issues that these fashion trends um, are representative of. As Fiona specialises in women's sport during the interwar years, um, she has a wealth of knowledge about uh, the evolution of sports clothing and indeed the wider changes in society um, during this period that facilitated these developments. Um, and through undertaking background research on the development of women's golf in Britain from the late 19th century, I have become interested in the development of golf fashion during this period. And whilst it is separate to my own research into women's golf in Scotland, it is closely linked to the impact of gender on women's participation in golf, which is central to my research. Um, during this presentation, we will provide a brief introduction to the development of women's golf fashion in Britain during the late 19th century, before going on to discuss the evolution of clothing worn to, worn to play golf from everyday wear to clothes designed specifically for the sport. We will then discuss Gloria Monoprio, the woman who challenged the status quo in relation to what was um, viewed appropriate clothes for women to wear when playing golf and the media attention that she attracted before finally drawing some conclusions. Um, Fiona and I will then welcome any questions that you have and we hope that you enjoy our talk. Thanks, Lauren. So women have played golf for hundreds of years. In fact, the earliest recording of women playing golf officially were the Musselburgh fishwives who participated and were noted in 1792 in the statistical account of Inveresk. However, it was the late 19th century that significant numbers of women took up the game across Britain. It was in this period that we see the origins of the modern organized game emerging. Scotland led the way in this regard. With the founding of the St Andrews Ladies Golf Club, later known as the St Andrews Ladies Putting Club, in 1867. The club was formed by and for local middle class women who wanted to play the game. And as membership increased, a designated space was sought and landscaped into a 15 hole putting green near to the Royal and Ancient Clubhouse in St Andrews. The club, run by a mixed committee, nonetheless provided women with a space where they could play the game themselves but the location of the course meant that they were still under the watchful eye of the male members of the RNA. Other clubs were subsequently established for women across the UK and Ireland. Amongst the earliest of these were Carnoustie, North Devon, Westward Ho and Wimbledon. 
The formalisation of the national game came about in April 1893, when Azette Pearson founded the Ladies' Golf Union. The LGU had a clear purpose, which was broken down into five objectives. To promote the interests of the game, to obtain a uniformity of the rules, and linked to that, it was tasked with establishing a handicapping system, it was to act as a tribunal and court of reference on the rules, and finally, it was to arrange an annual championship for its members. The LGU was initially composed of 15 clubs, all of which were based in England. Membership grew steadily with over 50,000 members having joined the organisation from around 400 affiliated clubs by 1911. The LGU was successful in all of its objectives, rules and regulations were drawn up and circulated to members, and the first championship was played in June 1893, and a universal handicapping system was established in 1896. It became clear, however, that each nation was in need of its own women's golf organisation to manage and represent players at a local level. As a result, the Irish Ladies Golf Union was established in December 1893 the Scottish Ladies Golfing Association in, 18, oh, in, sorry, in 1904, and the Welsh Ladies Golf Union in 1904. The establishment of these national organising bodies created a higher profile for women's golf, while at the same time underpinning it with a sense of legitimacy through its formalised rules, handicaps and competitions. This in turn encouraged more women and girls to take up the sport, with the numbers of those affiliating to regional bodies going continuously well into the 20th century. Golf was almost uniquely placed to accommodate societal expectations of Victorian women and their desire to play sport. Society functioned around a strict set of ideals which saw women as the angel in the home, whose primary roles were to associated with the care and nurture of their children and wider family members. They were expected to find personal fulfillment within their homes and its related experiences. Their biological functions were understood to be substantially different to that of men. They were thought to be weaker, to have a finite amount of energy, and that overexertion could cause significant trauma to their reproductive capabilities. Sports, therefore, sat outside of their sphere of influence. Sport was regarded as the perfect training ground for young men as competitive, participation pushed them both physically and mentally, making them stronger and more robust. By contrast, similar competitive exertions were thought to be dangerous to a woman's mental and physical well-being. Golf, however, represented a good compromise. It was not physically demanding in the way that hockey or playing football could be. And it was not aggressively competitive in the way, um, sorry, or aggressively competitive. The game was governed by strict rules of etiquette and was generally played in exclusive private clubs, which ensured that women played only with men of similar social standing and within clearly defined and socially acceptable circumstances. For these reasons, women's participation rates increased significantly in the later decades of the 19th century and well into the early 20th century, as we can see in this slide. By 1939, there were 1,060 clubs affiliated. So the interwar years, by the interwar years, the number of clubs affiliated to the LGU had almost tripled. If we consider that each of these clubs represented anything between a handful of members to a couple of hundred, we get a sense of just how quickly women were taking up the opportunity to formally register their participation. This growth and development needs to be seen within the wider trends of the period. The late Victorian period is often considered to be the birthplace of modern sport. It was during this time that many sports, for both men and women, established their governing bodies to draw together complex networks of clubs and individuals, to formalise their rules and regulations, and to set up events. Indeed, several other sports, which were popular with women, had formal organisations established in the last two decades of the 19th century, sports such as tennis and hockey. These sports fitted as they did within the established notions of femininity and gent gentility. Combined with their increasing role in middle-class female education, gained ground fast. Not all women's sports experienced such a positive growth in this period. Activities such as mountaineering and football had much more challenging births and faced significant public opposition. 
So what did these earlier players wear? During the late 19th century, no specialist golf clothing existed for men or women. Regulations regarding golf dress were dictated by society and the conventions and gender ideals of the period, ensuring that clothing worn on the golf course was merely an extension of the general day-to-day -day wear. For women, this included a corset, layers of petticoats, a long-sleeved blouse with a stiff collar and puffy leg of mutton sleeves, stockings, garters, a long skirt, heavy thick-soled shoes or boots, boots with nails in them, gloves and a straw boater hat. Golfing jackets were also compulsory for lady golfers during this period. These were often red in colour, especially at the most exclusive clubs, and were pleated at the back to enable the women to drive more easily from the tee. However, May Heslett argues that by the early 20th century, these were very seldom seen on the links. High stiff collars club ties, and club ties were another expected part of the uniform. As these clothes were not the most practical for, for golf, especially in all weathers, women began inventing modifications, such as the Miss Higgins hoop, seen here on the slide, an elastic band worn around the, way, around the knees to prevent skirts from blowing up in the wind, and leather sewn around the edges of long skirts to prevent mud in wet weather. During this period, golf attire for women was dictated by societal conventions, and, and what was considered appropriate dress for women, rather than golf gover governing bodies and authorities. The Ladies' Golf Union, LGU, did not publish regulations on what women should wear on the course. Instead, they led by example, with Azette Pearson, the founder of the organization, epitomizing the Victorian lady golfer. Pearson's Victorian Ensemble took 30 minutes and the attention of several maids to successfully attach all the corsets, stays, buttons and bows which held it together. Lady Margaret Scott, winner of the First Ladies Amateur Championship established by, established by the LGU in 1893, was praised for her elegance, demonstrating that women could play golf well whilst remaining feminine. And you can see Azette and um, Lady Margaret Scott in the picture there on the slide as well. Despite appearing highly impractical by today's standards, these fashions were viewed as necessary in Victorian society. For women, the absence of a corset or as little as an ankle on show would have been unacceptable during the late 19th century, raising concerns regarding loose morality. Women were expected to look feminine and ladylike at all times, in keeping with their role within the private sphere as wife, mother and homemaker. This view is promoted in the fashion pages of Golf Illustrated, which provided fashion and beauty advice to women. The styles promoted placed a primary emphasis on femininity rather than practicality. In her golf memoirs published in 1904, May Heslett demonstrates the pressure that society put on sporting women when they played games, including golf, to ensure that they remained feminine, neat and tidy, in keeping with their gender ideals and societal conventions of the day. Heslip portrays society's reaction to women's fashion, noting that, quote, when anyone is outrageously dressed in the effort to attain comfort, it casts a slur on the whole of society of lady golfers and gives occasion for slighting remarks about the athletic women. It is the duty of all to prevent these opportunities arising and to prove to the best of their ability that there is no foundation for the remarks which are too apt to be made after a large ladies golf meeting." End quote. She also argues that non-golfers stereotype women who play golf, quote, as a weird and terrible creature clad in the most extraordinary garments, striding along with self-possessed walk and oblivious to everything but her beloved game, end quote. And asserts that, quote, it should be the aim of all lady golfers of the present day to abolish this prejudice, end quote. By the early 20th century, more specialized golf clothing was being produced and advertised in golf magazines. Sport manufacturers began producing waterproof materials for skirts and jackets. Kenneth Durward's golfing garments created the Allendale skirt and coat, seen here, which the advert claims, quote, 
successfully solves the feminine problem of how to look smart and feel comfortable when playing golf, end quote. The Allendale skirt was specifically designed to, quote, allow plenty of freedom to the hips and knees without that fullness or bagginess which looks so unbecoming and is such a handicap to a lady golfer on a windy day, end quote. As hats remained a necessity for women during this period, hats specifically designed for sports were also appearing in popular golf magazines. Advertisements, however, demonstrate that upper class ladies were the first to have access to these more bespoke items of clothing, which would, would not have been affordable for the masses at the time. Popular manufacturers of elite sportswear during this period include Edgerton Burnett's, Debenham and Freebody and Peter Robinson's producing clothing, including ladies jackets and skirt suits made from special waterproof khaki serge, knitted sports coats and hats. The prices of these specialist clothes ensured that they remained exclusive to the upper class golfer during the early 20th century. Fashions were slowly changing in the decade leading up to this, the outbreak of war. The most significant development of the period was the widespread availability of the ladies' sporting boot. The boot, with a small heel made from brown or black leather with small grips on the sole, was the first purpose-made sports shoe for women. In the first few years of the century, the fashion remained long full skirts with long sleeved blouses and hats held in place by scarves or netting tied below the chin. By 1910, the skirts had lost their volume and were still ankle length, but narrower in shape. Jackets worn over long sleeve blouses had changed too, becoming tight shouldered and narrow around the waist. Brimmed hats continued to be worn, but held in place by a myriad of hat pins. Attitudes towards women's fashion began to change with the onset of the First World War in 1914. As women began taking on men's jobs in their absence, they started wearing clothes that were more practical and by comparison to previous fashions, more masculine in style. Malcolm Crane argues that, quote, tweed suits with long skirts, shirts and ties became almost a uniform for the new breed of women, end quote. Whilst women began wearing more masculine attire from the waist up, such as a stiff collar, tie and jackets which sported their club insignia, Rosalind Cosey maintains that, quote, women were only prepared to sacrifice their feminine appearance above the waist. The retention of a skirt safeguarded their femininity and was a dominant image for, of the female golfer for several more decades, end quote. This change in fashion trends from the First World War further demonstrates that golf dress was dictated by wider changes in society, as can be seen in the interwar period with the development of the modern women. The interwar years are often regarded as a significant period for women's sport. It was during this time that a range of sports opened up to women across Britain in a way that had been previously unseen. There were a number of factors which stimulated this development. Women's role in World War I had shifted societal expectations of what women were capable of while simultaneously empowering women themselves to pursue their interests and push back against established rules. Municipal and commercial provision of sports facilities also increased in considerably in these years, thereby opening up sporting experiences to those of all classes, not just those who were able to afford private club memberships or those with the right social connections. Experience was of course still mediated by class, gender and age, each of these factors influenced how often, where and with whom individuals could play sports. But the range of facilities available, and particularly in urban settings, ensured that many more people were able to access sport than before. A significant part of this development was the role of modernity, as we can see in this next cartoon. So here from the Daily Mirror in 1924, we can see that the modern woman is pictured as being athletic. So she's active in a number of sports, tennis, golf being one of them, hockey and hunting, but also as we can see at the bottom, socializing, dancing and so forth. So it's part of being that sort of stereotypical view we have of the flapper. 
Playing sports, socialising in sports venues and wearing sports clothing were all ways in which a woman could signal her ability to be modern and part of this modern movement. As the Illustrated Sporting and Dramatic News noted in 1924, sport was fashionable, quote, it is certainly a distinct advantage to any firm that wishes to achieve and maintain its reputation for being absolutely au raconte with affairs in the dress world to have its own sports designer, end quote. The interwar years were also marked by a new consumerism where mass pr production methods across a range of industries meant that the cost of products were lowering, ensuring that a range of goods, including sports clothing, became accessible to a wider range of consumers. As one fashion page noted, sports-specific clothing had, by the early 1920s, become an intrinsic element of mainstream fashion. Quote, mannequin parades, or parades of fashion, call them what you will, are in full swing, and a fact that cannot be too widely disseminated is that great attention is being given to the requirements of the sportswoman, end quote. Indeed, the pages of women's magazines followed this trend by regularly featuring stories about sport, and the fashion pages often included sports clothing. Discussions of what to wear on the tennis court, at the swimming pool or the golf course were regular features in mainstream magazines and their advertisements. So we're talking about magazines such as Vogue, Women's Weekly and Modern Women. The development of mass produced bespoke clothing for women in the interwar period meant that women were no longer expected to simply modify everyday wear for their sports participation. But instead, there was now an expectation that any serious woman golfer would invest in clothing designed specifically for playing sport. Retailers and advertisers were quick, therefore, to use the requirements of different sports to demark their products as suitable for specific activities and environments, placing a new emphasis on designs and textiles practicalities in their advertisements and in the descriptions on fashion pages. The sports magazines and newspapers of the period also featured significant coverage of women's sports fashions and discussions around these developments. Golf magazines such as Golf Illustrated and Golfing published standalone features on women's fashion and included regular discussions on their women's pages, something that I can say was not mirrored in relation to the coverage of men's clothing in this period. The changes in women's fashion generally in the 1920s were revolutionary. Styles became more figure-hugging and hem lines were raised. The wider train, trends of women's fashion slowly began to influence the types of clothing worn on the golf courses of Britain. Quote, the apparel may not always proclaim the golfer in nine times out of ten, however, it does proclaim the seasons of the year. This is just as it should be. It is no more reasonable to expect a sports girl to be indifferent to her personal appearance. End quote. Generally, women continue to wear skirts and blouses with long sleeves and hats and gloves. However, the styles of these garments had changed significantly, and hopefully you've seen that from the slides that we've just shown you. Hats continued to be an expected accessory on the golf course. Millinery became smaller and more closely shaped to the head. The most popular styles were the famous flapper cloche hats made from materials such as camel hair tweed or felt in natural muted colours, often with small turned out brims that framed the wearer's face. In the later years, hats made from materials such as jersey silk and crepe de chine were pioneered by the likes of Debenham and Freebody in a range of bright colours and patterns. There was also a move away from fitted jackets and they were replaced by knitted jumpers and long line cardigans. These knitted garments came in natural colours. But there was a fashion from the 1920s onwards for fair isle, jumper on, uh, fair isle um, textures patterns on jumpers and geometric prints on accessories such as scarves um, in bright colours to bring interest to otherwise monotone outfits. And you can see here an example of a long line cardigan on this slide. Um, such was the popularity of patterned material that W.K. Heseldin, who is one of the most prolific cartoonists of the interwar period, um, did a, a cartoon specifically about it for the Daily Mirror in 1920. This cartoon is called The, Golf, the Woman's Golf Costume, Man's Extra Handicap. And I think that says it all. It depicts a woman in a highly patterned skirt and jumper playing off a tee followed by a man who is too disorientated by the colours and patterns swirling before his eyes after her swing that he is unable to focus 
on his own ball to play. So skirts became shorter, usually on or just below the knee, as we can see in this other um, Hazeldean um, cartoon uh, at the bottom, um, rather than ankle length. They also became straighter and more fitted to the body, um, where earlier skirts had been voluminous and enveloping and concealing the body within. This development was arguably slightly more functional than previous styles, but they were nonetheless restricted um, the way their stride and stance. Skirts continued to be predominantly made from heavy knitted wool and tweed materials in winter and cloth flannel for summer in natural hues. One piece dresses were also introduced for the first time in this period. And we can see in this short clip from the British Pathway Newsreel from 1926, how these fashions looked on the golf course. So I'm just going to switch off the slides and hand over to Lauren, who's going to share her screen, show you this video. I should say that there is no sound with this um, video. Lauren, I think we're still viewing your screen. Is it still the, oh, I'm yeah. sorry. That's okay. okay. I'm on share. Okay. That's grand, thank you. I hope you can see my slides again, yep. Yeah. Perfect, yeah. okay. So that short video gives you a sense, I think it kind of brings to life um, what these costumes were like and how practical they were to play. So they were obviously far more practical than the kind of costumes that women had been playing in, in the Victorian and early Edwardian period, but there were still some challenges as we saw with the woman who was pitching um, out of the bunker there. So dresses and skirts remained the dominant clothing worn on the golf course in the interwar period. However, that was challenged in 1933. In October 1933, Gloria Minoprio caused a media sensation when she competed in the English Clothes Championship at Westford Hole, wearing tight-fitting peg-top slacks. Minoprio arrived late to the first tee in a large grey saloon car and had soon gained a reputation for suddenly appearing just before a match and disappearing afterwards. After the event, the LGU issued a public apology condemning the wearing of trousers on the golf course. This was the first time that the LGU came out publicly regarding dress regulations for women's golf. This decision not only demonstrates the LGU's reaction to women wearing trousers, but more significantly, society's attitude as a whole. This was the first time that a woman had been reporting wearing trousers on the golf course, and it was so shocking it was widely covered in mainstream British newspapers. In an article titled, Opponent Upset by Fancy Dress, the Daily Mail gave a detailed account of the, quote, tight-fitting, beautifully creased dark blue trousers strapped under suede shoes to match, a pullover, 
close fitting blue hat and gloves, end quote. Her appearance was so starkly different to, to conventional golf wear, her, uh, her, sorry, her opponent later noted that, quote, it was like playing a supernatural being, end quote. Monoprio's unusual dress and playing style, dressed all in dark clothing with tight fitting trousers and playing with only one club rather than a selection, caused unprecedented press presence at a women's golf tournament. Prior to 1933, Gloria Monoprio had been unheard of in the golfing world, only playing in the two big championships of the year. Regardless of whether she had an ulterior, ulterior motive for courting controversy, she made it clear that her motive was one of practicality, defending her decision to wear trousers by arguing that she found, quote, such attire to be more suitable for golf than skirts. They help with the swing of the club, are more comfortable, and are certainly modest, end quote. Newspaper reports of this event are invaluable in demonstrating society's attitudes towards Miss Monoprio and women wearing trousers in general. A reporter from the Yorkshire Evening Post asked women of varying ages to share their thoughts on women wearing trousers on the golf course. The responses varied with older ladies arguing that, quote, Miss Monoprio's costume is amusing, but not at all suitable for a golf course and rather ridiculous, end quote. And one young girl, however, could not understand why there was so much fuss being made about, quote, one girl golfer in black trousers, end quote. This suggests that younger women and girls growing up in the 20s and 30s, exposed to discourses surrounding modernity, were more open to changes in women's fashion, whereas older women remained reluctant to change. It is, however, somewhat paradoxical that a Northern, that a Northern Daily Mail reporter should argue that Monoprio had, quote, the most remarkable feminine fi figure ever seen at a golf meeting, end quote, when wearing trousers, which were viewed by society at the time as masculine and inappropriate for women. A similar idea was echoed in Tatler, which ran a discussion piece on women's golf in 1934, which noted in the op opinion of author Henry Longhurst that trousers for women were preferable to the prospect of shorts a fashion which was growing in popularity amongst lady golfers in America at the time. Longhurst detests, quote, I cannot help but think that they would do better to follow Miss Monoprio's example and play in trousers. More admirable garments for use on a windy seaside links can, hard, can scarcely be imagined, and the appearance, once the initial shock has been survived, is far superior. For myself, I make so bold to say that Miss Monoprio, if, con if convention be set aside for a moment, was not only the best looking, but also the best dressed player in the tournament." End quote. It is surprising, however, that the extensive media coverage was not reciprocated in the, pop in the popular British golf uh, periodical, Golf Illustrated. Perhaps the LGU were afraid that doing so would encourage more women to follow Miss Monoprio's lead and did not want to draw too much attention to the event. If this was the case, it can be argued to have been to some extent in vain, as Monoprio not only wore trousers in 1933, but did so the following two years at the English Post Championship. And ladies' golf union photograph albums demonstrate that other women began to follow her lead and can be seen to be competing in trousers. In 1938, a secretary of a golf club in Manchester questioned the ability of the club to enforce a ban on women's trousers, arguing that, quote, wearing trousers is common amongst women golfers, especially in wet weather, end quote. This suggests that society's attitude towards women wearing trousers to play golf were beginning to change by the late 1930s. However, LGU photographs and this short film demonstrate that the majority of women were still competing in skirts rather than trousers. Go.
Oh, sorry, I'm going to have to play that one at the end. I've lost my link. So I'm going to continue. Nevertheless, Gloria Monoprio's ability to challenge the status quo and influence women's golf fashion during the mid 1930s must not be overlooked. Her bold choice of attire started an important conversation amongst official organizations and female golfers themselves about what was both practical, fashionable to wear on the course in the early years after the women adopted her, after many women adopted her style, including Helen Holm, who wore an almost identical outfit when she won the ladies championship in 1934. So to conclude, golf clothing has been given very little consideration in, by academic studies. And yet, as we have demonstrated here, the development of women's sports clothing during the late 19th and 20th centuries offers a greater understanding of some of the challenges that women faced in their participation. The types of clothing that they chose to wear to play sports, um, such as golf, had to walk the fine line between what was practical and what was socially acceptable, two things which were often incompatible. A specialist mass-produced sportswear for golf developed in the 20th century, the variety of designs, textiles, patterns and colours available to women increased their options and allowed them more individuality. As we've seen during the interwar years, sports clothing became fashionable. And for some women, it became a way of demonstrating their own modernity. Women's sports clothing is often representative of wider issues and concerns around, in society around female bodies. Indeed, the issue of what women can or should wear to participate in a number of sports remains a contentious issue even now, almost 100 years after the period that we've been discussing this evening. And just to, to finish, um, thank you very much for listening. Um, if you've enjoyed what you've seen here tonight, um, a shameless plug. Um, we were participating in a documentary, myself and Hannah and Lauren, and actually several people who are in this audience this evening, called Iron Women. And it's being re-shown on BBC Alba on the 1st of October and will be on iPlayer thereafter. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, Fiona and Lauren. I think we'll just do a virtual clap. <laughs> um, <laughs> thank you everybody, that was so fascinating. Um, it is something that I've um, been fascinated by for a number of years now since started at the museum is this development of, um, of, of clothing and I think it's quite clear from the research that you've done that how golf clothing pushed regular fashions and I, you can see that within the the textiles that are used the the boots the shoes the shoes changing style and even the hats I hadn't really made that comparison obviously the plush hat that we're all so familiar with you can totally see why perhaps that was through the um through the golfers do you think that's fair to say that the female golfers really helped to push general fashions yeah, I think, I mean, I think it's hard to say which came first, you know, it's a sort of chicken and egg situation because from what we've seen in, in the research is that, you know, sportswear is, is so intrinsic in that interwar period in fashionable clothing. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, looking at the styles before in golf, they're very different to the styles that then develop in the 20s and the 30s. So it's hard to say that that definitely influenced it. But certainly we see the women, you know, taking these fashions and wearing them on the golf course but also wear them in everyday life as well. So that line for the first time kind of becomes blurred. It's no longer a kind of practical, um, something that can only be worn on the golf course or only be worn, you know, the tennis court or whatever. It's suddenly totally acceptable for you to wear it, you know, in a social situation um, out with that sporting environment. And that's really quite fascinating. Mm. And it's something that's mirrored in other countries as well. I know in France, for example, there's a whole sort of line of fashion they, they termed it sportif, um, which is basically that there were fashion houses in Paris who employed designers to develop this sportive kind of brand, if you like, um, lots of different fashion houses. And it was all about this, the new modern woman wanting to be physically active and wanting to show people that she was physically active. And the way of doing that was signaling it through how she dressed. Mm. 
yeah that that sense of modernity was was really interesting i'm just going to pause the recording